Hi, this is Paul. I'm going to talk about Jordan Peterson's axiomatic God versus Sam Harris's anti-masturbation God. I think my slide will advance. There we go. Now the audios have leaked from the Vancouver, the two Vancouver appearances. The sound quality is usually sketchy. You can hear most of the words. I haven't listened to all of it yet. I've listened to a lot of the first, a lot of the first event. Um, here's one of the more substantive moments in the first evening. I'm not going to give a link to the bootleg audio. I'm not going to play the bootleg audio, but I am going to talk about it and, and give some quotes because I think they're important. First of all, we should know, and, and, and actually most of what you get from the evening, you can get from, you could you could put together by knowing what these two have been saying. Because as many people reported from the event have said, there, there weren't necessarily a lot of surprises. But I thought the conversation, at least the parts that I've heard, were very interesting and very engaging. And I thought very enlightening. So bravo to all parties for pulling this together. So of course you know that, if you've watched my previous videos, that Jordan Peterson believes that your religion or even your God... Oh, there goes Buck. I'm having... Bucko, Bucko since his, Bucko since his, well, we'll bring up full screen here. Bucko since his uh, little overnight has, has been, he's had a hard time staying on the shelf. I think I just had, had too many beers there at, at, at my friend Rick's house. So, there we go. Stay, Bucko, stay. All right. So, your religion or your God is the axioms you act upon. And that's what Jordan Peterson says. And of course, if we go back into this and we look at the comparison of the two versions of reality that these two individuals are promoting, Peterson says reality is best conceived as a form for action. He's a pragmatist. Sam Harris is a materialist, a modernist materialist. Sam Harris says reality is best conceived as a space for objects. And now consciousness is in there too, but see, consciousness, again, I think for Sam Harris, is an extension. Consciousness is dependent upon material reality for Sam, Sam Harris. And that's, in a sense, what would separate him from, let's say, a traditional Buddhist, if you wanted to compare him with a traditional Buddhist. Because for Sam Harris, material is foundational and consciousness is derivative, dependent upon the brain that elicits this experience of consciousness. Your God for, Jen, for Jordan Peterson is the implicit axioms that you act out of. Sam Harris says God is a person in the sky, or at least he doesn't believe such a person exists, okay, um, that you can relate to, um, can do things for, or consign to you, and will consign to you an afterlife. So, and what's really at issue in terms of Jam, Sam Harris's anti-masturbation God is that God is a kind of being who looks down and judges you. For Sam Harris, God is very much a... And I'm going I'm to get into this in another video at some point. For Sam Harris, God is very much a product of contemporary American Christian evangelicalism, fundamentalism. It, the, the shape of the God that Sam Harris is protesting very much is from that, which is which becomes absolutely central to the debate that Peterson and Sam Harris will have during this video. Jordan Peterson says, "True beliefs are not tra your true beliefs are not transparent to you. Your actions express what you truly believe." In other words, in a sense, we are we are. Oh, what's the best word? We are alienated from our true beliefs for Jordan Peterson. And we don't know what they are, but we might discover them if we look at how we act and how we respond. For Sam Harris, your true beliefs are transparent to you. At least when you say, I'm not an atheist, then you're not an atheist. Your beliefs or facts are what you say they are. And again, if you look at, for those of you who are watching the video, if you look at this slide, this pretty much lays out the two people and where they're at. And as you listen to them talk, this is what they express. Now, I want to play a commercial that was around in 2012. And I remember seeing it, and I thought, 
This pretty aptly summarizes what I call natural religion, or especially the majority case of natural religion, and the commercial involves Lisa wanting to get a Verizon cell phone. So here's Lisa. Only $79.99 for a Lucid by LG? I can get a smartphone with Verizon 4G LTE? It'd be so easy to check Facebook, send emails, and the screen is easier to read in sunlight. The universe is practically telling me to get a smartphone. It's like, Lisa, it'd be super cool if you got a smartphone. Also, I like your outfit. Thanks, universe. Let's get me a Lucid. Come in and say hello. There she goes. Now, pay attention to the commercial. What is going on in that commercial? Why... Why is Lisa so excited about a smartphone? See, I would say again, Peterson is right. We see opportunities and obstacles. We see tools and obstructions. And Lisa sees this 2012 LG Lucid phone, and she wants it. And it's almost as if the universe is telling me. She's now personified the universe and... The universe is telling her something, and then in her mind, now maybe this is all the patriarchy that has been that she's been oppressed with her whole life, but, Lisa, buy the cell phone, and I like your outfit. Now, if, if this isn't a, a lovely, well, if you're, if you're post-Freud and you listen to this little commercial, you might say, yeah, see, we're just projecting our desires on the universe and our experience of God is that which we receive. Okay, that's, that's one way I suppose you could think about it. But thanks, universe. There you go, Verizon Lisa. Thanks, universe. Now, one of the things that not only I have noticed, but many people have noticed that the, the new atheists have really have a thing for American fundamentalism. Again, if you go back and if you Google and listen to Richard Dawkins on Unbelievable, here he's sitting with a Jewish and a Christian leader, and he says, "Well, you're not the kind of Christians I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to deal with and combat. It's all those American fundamentalists who want to take evolution out of the textbooks in in Kansas and Oklahoma. These are the these are the real danger and the scourge that I'm trying to get rid of." Now, Sam Harris is the youngest of that group and seemingly the most energetic, and he's developed the biggest podcast following. And so, Sam Harris and Matt Dillahunty and a whole group of others have taken it upon themselves to be against this group and try to talk Americans out of being religious. And of course, they feel like their side is winning. So Matt Dillahunty talks about his old life as a Southern Baptist, and it's practically a Southern Baptist conversion story that he says. He used to live in the darkness of his Southern Baptistry, and now he's out into the bright, shining light of reason. Now, watch watch which, which God Sam Harris is responding to. How my question would be, how vehemently would he object to Lisa's universe? Now, now Lisa's, the god of Lisa's universe, or Verizon Lisa's god, is, is in many ways a god avoidment, avoidment term. And I've seen this with many people who have deconverted from Christianity. They no longer go to church. You ask, say, well, I, I don't know if I can really believe in the Christian god. I don't know if I believe in god, but I think there's stuff in the universe and maybe it's Jediism and maybe it's Star Wars and, and and this tends to prove Peterson's point that once people stop believing in organized religion, it doesn't mean they stop being religious. In fact, it just tends to mean their religion gets more sloppy and gets a little bit more self-convenient and gets a little bit more... it. it it is much more a projection of what they as an individual think and believe their biases and probably what they want to believe. Part of what organized religion does is sort of puts a curb on the rotisserie religion or the salad bar religion that that is pretty much common in terms of human beings. So Verizon Lisa walks up to the store and she sees this phone that she likes and it's almost as if the universe is telling me and and Lisa, go buy the phone. And by the way, I like your outfit. You look nice today. Thanks, universe. Off you go and you buy the phone. And so what Lisa is doing in 2012, in my experience, is also pretty common to the nuns. 
not the N-U-N-S's, but the N-O-N-E-S's, who are getting rid of organized religion. They've got, they're skeptical about churches and religious leaders and religious authorities. But if you sit down and talk to them, they usually don't become hardened atheists. They, they usually become just kind of squishy religious people whose behavior conforms to whatever they see the community around them conforming to. Now, that's not always the case, and I'm sure that's not the case of anyone listening to this video, because, of course, in Lake Wobegon, all the children are above average, but that has been my experience. That tends to be what we do when we walk away from organized religion, because suddenly things are less structured. You're less, you're listening less to people who may or may not know more than you. There's less community involved in the formation formation of your religion. Your religion gets increasingly individualistic and therefore increasingly subject to your own biases, subject to your own idiosyncratic experiences, subject to your anecdotal view of the world. Now, all of us are subject to our anecdotal view of the world. That's what an anecdotal view means. What happens when you actually work your religion with a group of people in a communitarian, organized fashion is that begins to put limits on your biases. It doesn't get rid of them, but it tends to hedge them and hem them in and challenge them. And that's one of the ways that actually having religious practice or even just having significant conversations with other people about spirituality or religion or whatever you want to call this aspect of your life changes you. But I don't get the sense that the new atheists are really all so much against that community. They seem mostly against established religions, religious leaders, Christian books, this kind of thing. Now, I, I certainly think they would complain about people doing this kind of thing, but that doesn't seem to bother them as much as when religious people organize and want to do things such as influence politics or get involved in the public square or whether or not they want to make a bake a wedding cake. These are, it's it's all these public square type things that tend to initiate the conversation for a lot of people. And this really isn't a change from the, the secular truce that has governed a lot of American history, where basically we say you can have private ideas, but keep them private. If you really want to, in your own mind's eye, worship Baal or Molech or the Flying Spaghetti Monster or any Hindu god that meets your fancy, whether he's got an elephant face or a monkey face or how many arms your your Hindu god you might might have, that's okay, but keep it private. And in public, act, there's the key word, act like a good citizen. Behave yourself and follow the rules. Now, Jordan Peterson is coming along and saying, hey, wait a minute, there's a foundation, There, there's stuff happening here that isn't the same. In other words, when the rules are significantly different in 2018 than they were, let's say, in 1958, a lot of people say, well, that's progress. Well, of course you think it's progress because, well, you've if, to the degree that you've agreed with the changes, well, then you look at it as progress. Now, if you disagree with the changes, you look at it as corruption. So, we're still dealing with individual human beings, individual perceptions, individual biases. And again, these things start getting shaped and formed as we start talking to one another and comparing notes and saying, I don't think you should believe that. I think you should believe this. And we start having arguments and give evidence, so on and so forth. Now, what was so exciting about listening to this video is Jordan Peterson's axioms that came because I I listened to the video and that yeah the quality isn't that good but these axioms I was very impressed I, and I think Peterson's got a lot going on here and these are I I hope Jordan Peterson will post them on his blog the at in in the wording that he has because I know he's always working on this kind of stuff because these are pretty good and these are worth talking about so if Jordan Peterson versus Sam Harris's axiom number one. 
God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest time frames but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects within the here and now. You could probably distill however many words Jordan Peter said and Peterson said in this entire quote unquote debate into this one axiom because it's all here and he's sort of compressed it into this is it a run-on sentence? I'll let you editors out there decide. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time as the most real aspect of existence manifest themselves across the longest time frames but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects within the here and now. And that's where he will differ with Sam Harris. Now, for those Christians reading here and immediately finding deficiencies in this axiom, I would remind you that this is, Jordan Peterson is not pretending to articulate the Christian God or Christianity. This is an attempt to discover how human beings express God by their actions from below. And this from belowness will be evident as we continue to go through these axioms. Just, I mean, nearly every word in this long sentence is vital for its meaning. It's how we imaginatively and collectively, okay, this is what we're doing. We're doing it imaginatively and collectively. And when we get into the next parenthetical remark, this will be very important. Represent, so in other words, these stories these names, these, um, in various cultures, graven images, statues, pictures, represent the existence and action of consciousness. It's a really interesting word. I could sit down and have a really long, interesting conversation with Jordan Peterson just about these axioms. They are really interesting and really thought-provoking and actions of consciousness across time as the most real. Okay, now remember, you got to go you might have to go back to Jordan Peterson's definition of reality, okay? And that's why this is not just a simple conversation between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris. They have fundamental fundamentally different definitions of reality, different definitions of truth, different definitions of what is at the basis of human consciousness. For Sam Harris, materiality is at the basis of, of human consciousness. For Jordan Peterson, a bit more along the lines of the phenomenology, being, capital B, again, go back and look at what he's um, written in terms of Heidegger, that is our most basic reality. Now, again, as soon as I say that, a lot of materialists will object because they've got this monarchical vision that they are asserting that we are seeing reality, we are seeing the matter, we are seeing how the brain is dependent upon the matter, so on and so forth. Peterson says, no, that's not what we're seeing. We're, we're, we're seeing through consciousness, and so we have to start there, and, and Sam Harris tries to get there, but again, I don't think Sam Harris really actually gets there. He's still much more of a materialist. So, existence and action of consciousness across time. So, Jordan Peterson, whereas the monarchical vision is this, is, an, is a vision outside of time. It's this static, timeless vision that really exemplifies the, the materialist imaginative assumption and I would say assertion of reality objects in space in a timeless in a timeless space that doesn't change there's some Platonism in there that is that is the materialist perspective and Jordan Peterson says no no we don't have we don't have access to that across time we have to include time we have to include mind. We have to include materiality. The more things we can include in this picture, the truer the picture will be because this is actually how we live, not 
saying we don't have free will, but then we go home and we kiss our children and we care deeply for them and we care far more for them than the little chickens that we sacrificed in order to give us our dinner or the plants that we sacrificed in order to munch on some popcorn. Represent the existence and actions of consciousness across time as the most real aspect of existence manifests themselves. So there's something coming at us. It isn't just solipsism. It isn't just, you know, minds in vats that are having experience. There's, there's, a, there's a duality involved between mind and matter. Most real aspects, aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest time frames. Time, because now... The, the truer it's going to be, the truer it's got to be for long. If something is true for this moment now, if it's been true for a very long time, such as the existence of this book that I bought back in the 80s, well, this, is, this is truer in some ways than the thoughts that are in my mind at this moment, which a moment from now is going to be pushed, out, pushed away by the other moments. So again, we're, dealing, we're trying to deal with all these things. So we have to deal with time frames, and we want to have very long time frames because we want it to be more real than just Paul Vanderclay sitting in front of his computer, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects within the here and now. My thoughts, are my thoughts apprehensible? Are the laws of physics apprehensible as objects? No. That's a big problem if you're a materialist, a problem that many people are trying to say you're not really fessing up to, but I think it's a big problem. So God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects within the here and now. And now comes a big and vitally important and very illuminating parenthetical comment that Peterson gives. And I missed a couple words and some things were garbled, but I did my best trying to get it out. What that means is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical. Now, I've been burned on hearing that word before, so I thought he said metaphysical. What that means is that you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure as a consequence of the process of evolution that, and I didn't catch the word in there, that blank over unbelievably vast expanses of time that formed or, and it structures your perception of reality in ways that they wouldn't be structured if you'd only lived for the amount of time you were going to live. In other words, well, let me finish this and then we'll talk about it. And that's also a part of the problem of deriving values from facts because you're evanescent and you can't derive values from the facts that portray themselves to you in your lifespan, which is why you have a biological structure which is 3.5 billion years old. Okay, what's Peterson saying here? He's this is this is in a sense his project in a nutshell okay he pretty he put it pretty compactly in here that this reality has been built into us way 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 back and this he he gives examples of it when he's talking about genesis and that perhaps our eyesight has developed to be as good as it is and our brains because we're looking for predators and our brains for pattern recognition because we're looking for predators and color and talk to any evolutionary biologist and and the main job that they have is trying to give reasons in words logos to explain what is our shape what is our behavior why how have we been constructed now we're, there's a little there's a little telos and intent being in there now i know a lot of people you know whatever take it out put it in however you want to manage that but we have been constructed and shaped and formed in a way that we find ourselves today and this makes sense of our world and this isn't 
just our biology. It's not just my eyesight. It's not just my sense of smell. It's not just the genetics that have made me lose my hair or have it go gray at a young age or given me my size, which is six foot four, or my cholesterol levels or all of these things. But in fact, it impacts our behaviors, but not just me individually, but us as communal creatures. We have grown up like this. Now, this is not this is science this is not something that you can say well that's just what church people believe no this is this is blue church ortho well not really blue church because uh, that's the whole conversation this is scientific orthodoxy this is the this is the project of the universities now at least in the west and to a certain degree worldwide this is the reigning paradigm. So let's look at this again. What that means is that you have conceptions of reality. We don't just see things. We're, we're already predetermined to see certain things, to filter other things. And when those filters don't work, you have things like schizophrenia and autism. But if everything everything's functioning as it should, oh boy, none of these words, you have conceptions of reality built into your biological and metaphysical structure. I'm going to leave metaphysical word aside because that's really going to get complicated in this sentence. As a consequence of the process of evolution that over unbelievably vast expanses of time and it structures your perceptions of reality in, it structures your perceptions of reality in ways that wouldn't be structured if you only lived for the amount of time you were going to live. In other words, you can't have a human being without this long trail of constructed process. And, and I don't mean that just in terms of the physical sense, our behaviors. And that's why people study rats to try to get insight into human behavior. People study chimps to try to get insight into human behavior and Sam Harris most of those people most of the most of the atheists that jordan peterson is talking to will agree with this as will brett weinstein we are not blank slates when we are born there's tons built in now recently one of my daughters rescued a kitten so now we're having the whole kitten business which i've we've been through a number of times in our lives kittens don't tend to last long in my household but I'm watching this kitten, and this kitten has a tremendous amount built in. This kitten, I've, our family has rescued, I don't know how many kittens, and kittens do the same things. They play with the same things, and they develop in the same ways. And I have, I've had dogs and kittens, and I've had a menagerie of pets with all my five children over all the years that we raised them. And I've watched guinea pigs and mice and gerbils and kittens and puppies. And, you know, we've done all of these things. And if you watch these animals enough, you see patterns and you say, there's stuff going on here. And the, the kitten doesn't sit there and say, now I should really... I should really bat this little thing around because that's going to be important for developing my brain and my hunting skills when this kitten is never really going to have to hunt. This kid's, this kitten's probably going to get its food and its health care free from me for life. I hope not. Anybody want a kitten in Sacramento? Break my daughter's heart, but make me happy. Anyway, This kitten doesn't sit there and think, this is what I need to do. And if you go back and you look at um, Thomas Reed's um, Scottish common sense realism, you know, a baby doesn't sit there and say, oh, it's time to work on my hands today. If these operations were left to our conscious mind, none of us would exist. This is, this is humanity. This is how we are. This is not doubtable, should not be doubtable by Sam Harris. But what Jordan Peterson is saying, this religion stuff evolves with us and is a central part of our package. Now, again, as a Calvinist, I flip hats, 
let's say I'm talking to Alvin Plantinga. Alvin Plantinga would say, well, don't forget, John Calvin's census divinitatis. Well, what's that? Well, John Calvin says, our religious nature is built into us. Not only do we have a human nature, we have a religious nature, and it's deep within us. Now, of course, according to myself and Alvin Plantinga and other people, this, this comes at us from below and is designed to connect with us from above. Now, Jordan Peterson is saying, I'm leaving the above st stuff alone, but from below, we seem to have all the hookups to relate to a god. Now, again, Freud and others might say, no, we're projecting upwards, and that's why it looks like we have the hookups. And again, but Peterson is arguing, you can account for the hookups by looking at human history, very ancient history, human evolution. This is what, this is an adaptive aspect of us. Well, if it's an adaptive aspect, well, now suddenly we're going to say, to a degree with Brett, Hatt, to Brett Weinstein, well, what adaptive, what adaptive aspects do we have that we now consider good versus bad? Well, that gets complicated because good for what? Or bad for what? And a little bit later, we'll talk about good versus evil. So in other words, this right here, this critical, this crucial parenthetical that Peterson has that I'm showing on the screen for those of you listening, this is really key to Jordan Peterson. And if you want to understand a big part of, at least the part of the conversation that interests me, this is a really big deal. And I can see why Jordan Peterson was very excited to talk to Sam Harris and to work on this stuff, because this is foundational to, from what I've seen, everything that Jordan Peterson is. Now, Axioms 2 through 5. God is that which is eternally, that which is eternally died and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being. I thought that's what he said. Truth. God is that which is eternally died. God is that which eternally died and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being. Truth. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of value. God is what calls and responds in the internal call to adventure. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is the future to which we have sacrifice it, we make sacrifices, and something akin to transcendental repository of reputation. Wow. These are, I mean, I, I'm very impressed by these axioms. Here's a cool one. If you're an evolutionary biologist, Jordan Peterson said, says, God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. And then another big parenthetical. Men arrange themselves into hierarchies and rise in the hierarchy, and there's principles that are important and that determine the probability of their rise, and those principles aren't tyrannical power. This is where he's getting on his social hobby horse, which many of us have heard many, 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 many times. And those principles aren't tyrannical power. They are something like the ability to articulate truth, logos, and the ability to be competent, and the ability to make appropriate moral judgments. And if you can do that in a given situation, then all the other men will vote you up the hierarchy, so to speak, and that will radically increase your reproductive fitness. So, poor Donald Trump. If he had been living a couple of thousand years ago, being president would have afforded him more, a bigger harem. Now, in a sense, given our history, being president of the United States is probably acting like a big break on his sexual desires. It didn't break John F. Kennedy, so that just shows how much things have changed in the last 50 years. Anyway, I shouldn't stop in the middle of these things. Those of you listening, I'm sorry. It's just going to be the way it is. So vote you up the hierarchy. Uh, where were we? Um, given situation that all other men will vote you up the hierarchy, so to speak, and that will radically increase your reproductive fitness and the operation of that across long expanses of time looks to me like it's codified into something like God the Father. It's also the same thing that makes men attractive to women. Women peel off the top of the male hierarchy. The question is what should be on top of the hierarchy. The quote-unquote answer 
right now is tyranny as part of patriarchy. That's what he's critiquing. But the real answer is something like the ability to use truthful speech, logos, in the service of, let's say, well-being. And so that's something that operates over tremendous expanses of time and plays a role in the selection for survival itself, which makes it a fundamental reality. And Peterson's on one of his rolls, and you know when he gets going on a roll, he can go for 10, 15 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. Sam Harris isn't going to stop, isn't going to let him go, so Sarah, Sam Harrison stops him and says, foul. No. Yeah, I know Jordan Peterson, egghead, brilliant man, studied studied mythology and stuff, have all these ideas about this quote-unquote God that's somehow deeply embedded in our evolutionary code that people are acting out. That's not what I'm interested in talking about. In a sense, he says, you've swapped, this is, these are Sam Harris's words, the traditional definition of God that quote-unquote everyone believes in for your, and this is not Harris's quote, your axiomatic God. Because the traditional God, according to Sam Harrison, cares if you masturbate. And they have a rather, a little bit of back and forth on that one, which was rather humorous. A personal God who hears and answers prayers. And right here, Sam Harrison, Sam Harris, Sam Harris exposes the God he really has an issue with. And now I would wonder if Sam Harris would go to his therapist. His therapist might sit down with him and say, Sam, why on the couch? Um, what happened to you as a child that you have, you have all these real, did, did, did you, did someone make you go to church and then do bad things to you? Because boy, you're, you really worked up about this particular God. Now, maybe it's all the politics around getting on creationism and getting evolution out, but this this really triggers you, Sam, and, and, and maybe we should talk about it. Well, other things trigger Peterson, other things trigger me. Everything gets triggered one way or another. But this is, Sam, and, and when Sam Harris says this, again, my friend who was there says about a 65% Sam Harris crowd, huge applause, because this is what I think a lot of Sam Harris's fandom, when they hear Peterson, they say, you're not being honest, you're ducking the question. When we ask you, do you believe in God? This is the God we have in mind. Belief is what we have in mind. And we want to be able to put you in that box. And this is exactly why Peterson stops and says, I don't mean the God I act as if is real is not the God you're pointing to. The God you're pointing to is what a, and here's Peterson as a therapist, is what some smart 13-year-old objects to, and what Peterson is probably doing is thinking about the God that he, as a smart 13-year-old, objected to, and as C.S. Lewis, as a smart 13-year-old, objected to, and as many smart 13-year-olds objected to. Peterson is saying, that's, that's a really cheap representation of God, and doesn't take at all seriously the role that this other God, this axiomatic God that I'm articulating, has played in the development of human civilization. You think you can just get rid of this little 13, this God that you imagined when you were 13 and really haven't updated or refined very much in all these years. You think that you can just pull this God out and have the rest of the Jenga tower just stay there. And Peterson says, nope, don't think so. And again, this is the heart of the of the fight between fight conflict conversation it's not a, it's not a nasty conversation and when peterson as he said in subsequent interviews a number of times he and sam harris and, and i believe again there are layers to this both of them want to win they enjoy when they have a gotcha moment that's part of the fun but at the same time both of them are also trying to sharpen themselves and learn and and now some of you again you say Paul, you're too nice. That might mean, Paul, you're naive. I could have a conversation about this whole dynamic in Romans 1 as well, but uh, let's take, let's take both people at face value. Let's take their, let's take their word for it and all their body language. You know, at the end of this, they're not getting up and killing each other. 
This, that has happened plenty of times in theological disputes throughout history. They are shaking hands. They are agreeing to meet again. They are agreeing to talk in. All of this, in my opinion, is moral progress. Now, we could have a debate about that too, but I think it is. Now, Peterson contests. I'm going to take a drink. So, so Peterson contests and says, well, you know, I, and I agree with Peterson on this point, I can understand where a lot of people define God that way. But, Peterson basically says, people have been listening and responding to the God that Peterson has been describing. In other words, and this is what got me into this, whatever this is that I'm in now on YouTube and doing meetups and interviews and all this kind of thing. People are listening to Peterson, and they might not be able to put it together in their conscious mind, but their watchers, their mental minions, are eating this stuff up. And they're, they're poking the conscious guy, saying, hey, 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 pay attention to this. This is important. We, we, we don't quite know why it's important, but there's, there's, the, see, the mental million, the mental minions have, have real good noses. Do minions have noses? I don't know. The mental, the, the mental minions have real good noses and they, and they smell, is there, Peterson always says, the, our information seeking circuits, I have no idea if that language is accurate, our, our information seeking circuits are the same circuits as our food seeking circuits. Now that, that makes some sense because we've developed these incredible brains partly to eat because we got to eat. That makes perfect sense. So our mental million minions are always on the search for information that might be useful. And that's why lots and lots of people have listened to Jordan Peterson and said, I don't know what he's saying. I don't really understand what he's saying. I can't really articulate what he's saying, but he's saying something important. And my minions, my committee of minions in my head are having little meetings and and we're going to keep listening to Peterson and we're going to buy his book and we're going to send him money on Patreon and we're going to go and listen to him talk. And even if he just gets on stage and rambles for an hour and a half and answers random questions, I'm still learning. There's something to this guy that bears paying attention to. Pay attention. That's what our, that's the, the mental minions of hundreds of thousands of people are doing and have been doing and that's what my mental minions have been doing and this entire project on YouTube for me has been trying to figure this out and I think I'm making progress. They have this God in their intuitions but they haven't been articulating him well. I think that's right. And I think he's actually, I think you can demonstrate that Peterson is right. In fact, it's not hard to demonstrate at all. All you have to do is read history or read ancient religions, and it's all over the place. Sam Harris contests, well, there's ghosts. And when people say they believe in ghosts, there's an implicit and common definition. And now what you're doing, Jordan Peterson, is, is you're redefining ghost as your relationship with the unseen. Now again, pay attention to the bias towards the visual that materialists tend to have, and we've talked about this before, this monarchical vision. This is, this is a bias in that philosophical system. Jordan Peterson is saying your relationship with the unseen, well, that's ghosts. And Sam Harris can say, I don't believe in ghosts. And so Jordan Peterson will say, yes, you do, because you have a relationship with the unseen. And Peterson said, this isn't at all what I'm talking about. And I think Peterson is exactly right. This isn't at all what he's talking about. This is much deeper. A little bit later, I'm going to give an illustration of why I think this is much deeper than just this little facile ghost analogy that Harris sort of whipped on stage. And what really stuns the show is that Brett Weinstein at this time point pops in and says this, I do not believe in a supernatural God, but the God I just heard Jordan Peterson describe, I do not have any difficulty why he might care if you masturbate and don't have any trouble figuring out how we might, how he might answer prayer. And again, I wasn't there. 
I can't wait for the video to come out. I want to see this moment. But just from what I heard, my mental minion said, boom. Why? Why? Why was Brett Weinstein saying this so important? Because I think in that moment, Brett illustrated the Jordan Peterson dynamic. Because here you have someone who is a, you know, he's not even on the same page with Jordan Peterson. He's got plenty of things he could talk back and forth with Jordan Peterson about, and plenty of things he differs with him on. But basically he says, hey, Jordan, I can understand your God, and I can understand how this God impacts history and impacts behavior and has things to say about masturbation and how people experience answers to prayer. And then Jordan Peterson goes on and talks about, gives, a, in my opinion, a very credible a very credible account from below of how people experience answers to prayer. Now, Again, I've got to be really careful here because I've got credentials in other camps that when I talk this way, plenty of people in the comments section start to say, well, you're not much of a Christian. All right, judge me as you want. Hey, you know what? There's one who judges me, and that's the one I stand before. I am not judged by the comments section. What is Jordan Peterson doing? What is Brett Weinstein acknowledging? They are both acknowledging the project that from below, Religious experience is an adaptation, and it's a reasonable adaptation, and it's been a fruitful adaptation. Now, where Brett Weinstein would begin to engage the conversation would be, to what degree can we evaluate its utility moving forward, and what criteria will we use to evaluate the artifacts of ancient religion and try to find them useful for moving forward now. And it's at that point that Brett Weinstein and I would probably have much more of a conversation because I think what we tend to see from the, from many agnostics and almost all atheists is that they almost always undervalue re the utility of religion. And it's on that spectrum that Jordan Peterson will separate himself from Brett Weinstein. But this is where this is where the three of them are laying out on stage. And it's at that moment that Brett says this, that in a sense, Sam Harris is alone. And now he gets nervous because, well, why? Because we're human beings and we like to be in, be in groups and we believe in groups. And, and this is how we work. And then suddenly Sam Harris has a sense that, am I losing this debate? Uh, yeah, you are losing this debate. That's been the whole Peterson phenomenon. Now, there's plenty of people out there, like the woman that made the videos after the events. No, Jordan, or Sam Harris really won. Oh, okay. And Jordan Peterson fans will say, no, Jordan Peterson really won. Okay. But if you're a social psychologist, how will you determine who won and lost? Well, you're going to look at large trends and you're going to look at 10, 15, 20, 100, 200 years from now, and maybe 200 years from now, probably not. But someone might look back and say, there was this event in Vancouver, and what this event shows is this. It's not unlike, say, Darwin's origin of the species, or Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, or John Calvin's Institutes, or... Um, Martin Luther's Babylonian captivity of the church, or I mean, there's there's many, 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 many books throughout human history that are significant. Yeah, I let the phone ring. Sam Harris contests the pluralism objection, or the stories of Hindus are very different, and they seem to work, and there's some back and forth on this. Brett talks about some interoperability. Peterson works on this a bit, but now now I'm going to kind of transition from reporting on the video and, and the analysis that I've done on the video and slowing down the video. Because again, I think this section bears slowing down and thinking about and chewing on because I think this is one of the key moments in that evening. Is Hindu Buddhist version of natural religion really all that different? You see, part of the difficulty that we have when we have the, the pluralist religion debate 
is that so few people know a lot about both sides. Because even to the degree that I know some things about the other side, I obviously know a great deal more about Christianity and its history. I think, in all fairness, when you look at reli parallel religions, you say, well, there's, there's, there, there are commonalities and there are differences. And some of the commonalities may be striking. Some of the differences are extraordinary. But there's always both. And so if you're going to do comparing, it's really important to raise the resolution and start getting specific about what you're comparing and how they're actually functioning in people's lives. So we'll get to that in a couple minutes. Now I want to summarize Jordan Peterson's claim, try and summarize it even more closely. For human beings, in order to overcome all our threats, threats by animals, threats by war, threats by plague, threats by famine, human beings evolved both genetics and the story verse. The story verse, you can read Harari, who, is, who of course is another atheist. We evolved the story verse, and that's where Brett Weinstein says this is an adaptive ability, and where Jordan Peterson says it's adaptive, and it's not just it's not just the capacity for it, but there's content in it that is a product of the process. And this oh, I'm already summarizing my summary. In order to overcome all their threats, human beings evolved via genetics and the story verse, personified stories that created communal, imaginative, storified structures that proved effective for survival in nature and competitive between other, other storied groups. In other words, from below, obviously genetics was carried on and Let's just assume that for now. That's a whole other big discussion. Because there's a whole lot we... Do. When you hear people blithely talk about just the evolution of life and human beings as if it's everybody knows how that where this works. No, that's, that's simply not true. People have reasons to believe that it happened this way, but we can't reproduce it. And we don't even, in fact, know how it happened when you get way down to the chemistry and the biology of those first steps. We have no idea. And again, look at James Tour's video, videos on that. I've shown him in, in past videos. So, okay, but let's, let's just give it all, let's, let's, let's give you all evolutionary science. Okay. Peterson and Weinstein are saying, from the bottom, not only our capacity for religion developed, but our capacity for religion was crucial and integral and adaptive and helped us not only survive but overcome all of the threats and competitions that we have faced so far. And that's why human beings have been such a dramatically successful species from this Darwinian evolutionary perspective. And the story verse is not only something that has developed from it, but it's been foundational to our success, not only against nature and our capacity to colonize nature, but has also been integral in our competition with each other. And if you look back over some of my past videos, one way to understand history is the competition of storied civilizations. What what competition and warfare between civilizations really is, 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 is stories fighting one another. Now, these are enormous, multi-layered, incredibly complex stories, usually with connections to other stories, but stories have us, we don't have stories. In other words, one way of looking at humanity is that we are just the hosts <laughs> We are just the hosts for stories, but stories are the dominant parasites that are driving our behavior and, and driving 
hu the human story forward. I mean, think about that. What if hosts, what if story, what, what if we are the hosts to a degree, but we're not the complete host? Because again, what if there is another host that has injected us with rationality and story and, and we are merely carrying it along to its climax? Now, this isn't hard to understand. That's what the Bible is. That's what Harry Potter is. That's what Tolkien wrote. That's what every good fiction writer writes. And in a sense, I, I don't have a lot of fiction books in my office because I'm usually reading other things in here. But, but in a sense, we are the host for story in a much deeper way, obviously, than this book is a host for the story. But the story is the virus. The story is that which governs. Well, well what is God? Well, the real object, the real thing Sam Harris is objecting it to is God is story. Yeah, God is story. And, well, let's try and get rid of all story. Yeah, good luck. Well, that's called nihilism and see if you want to live without story. If there's anything that I think we know from watching human beings, watching what motivates them, watching what moves them, it's story. Why is Netflix? I mean, the, the access to story has just within my own lifetime just gone. I mean, my kids watch. Back in the day, I used to have to hope something came on one of the few channels on TV to watch it or pay money and go see a movie. And then VHS came along and it was like, wow, you can watch movies that you want at home for as much as you want. And then, of course, DVD and then, of course, Netflix and, and on demand and so on and so forth. And YouTube story is winning. You have a hard time getting rid of story. And so now we have the question, are we just the host? Are we the disposable host? And now go back to the couple of videos ago that I was talking about. I would say, in fact, our body is the host. What I am is a story. That's how you understand me. You just know little bits of my story watching my video. But I am much more of a story than this physical body. Now... Again, listen to Jordan Peterson. I'm embodied. Um, my brain isn't just between my head. It's, it's distributed throughout my body. You cannot make a robot that interacts with the world without giving it a body. It can't even see. It can't differentiate. So I'm deeply tied to my body. But which part of me is actually the truest part of me that is most enduring, that is most real? And I would argue it's a story. That's what is most real to me. Now, the ancients would call that a psyche in Greek or a soul in English or a self. Well, what is a self? Well, a self is a story. So this is his claim that this story has come up for 3.5 billion years. The content of those shared stories, they were written down far later then developed or communally held and expressed in action, drama, art, etc. And the content of these stories became the Bible and other books. And this process is mostly unconscious. Sam Harris, Brett Weinstein, and Jordan Peterson could agree that the writers of the Bible didn't quite all know exactly what they're doing when they wrote it down. And those of you who have watched my videos from a number of months ago know I believe in organic inspiration, which means that Paul and the prophets didn't just sit down and say, oh, I'm going to write the Bible today. Paul was writing a letter. Now, did Paul believe God was directing him to write that letter? Absolutely. That's part and parcel of his religious framework. But Paul probably didn't imagine that we would today be debating what he wrote the Corinthian church, if he had, it would have been wonderful if he had been a little bit more explicit about when he's quoting his adversaries and when he's admonishing them himself. Although that would have put a whole lot of New Testament scholars out of work, perhaps. Anyway, so the content of those shared stories became the Bible, and this process is mostly unconscious. It's expressed in beliefs, stories, and actions, and is likely indispensable for our survival. That, still today, there's Jordan Peterson's mission. 
That's why he gets so excited. That's why he is crossing the U.S. and Canada and going over to England and the Netherlands and going to other places in the world and Australia and talking because he is he is on a mission. He is a preacher and he's saying, this has all come up from below and it is vital to our survival. It has made Western civilization what it is now and we dispense with it at our peril. Boom, there's Jordan Peterson. That's what he's doing. Is he right? Sam Harris says, ah, we can get rid of these stories. We don't need those old stories. When my grandmother was, as they were continuing to downsize, so they went from a condo to a little retirement place, and they had two bedrooms when she and my grandfather were alive, and then he passed away, then she had to go down to one bedroom. She had all these pictures. She said to my aunt, no one wants to see these old pictures. My aunt's like, I want to see these old pictures. My aunt's pulling them out of the trash, and we're not quite sure what all was lost. But in a sense, that's Sam Harris. He's kind of like my grandmother. We don't need those old stories. Get rid of them. And Jordan Peterson's saying, we need those old stories. If we lose those old stories, we lose us because, well, he's not saying this. I'm saying this. We are stories, and our stories are integrated into these other stories. And this is what civilization is. And this is what a life worth living is. And so, it's story, baby. Ask Disney making billions on Marvel. Ask Harry, the Harry Potter fandom. Ask the Tolkien fandom. Ask Christians all over the world. It's story, baby. Sam Harris's objection. I have a real issue, Sam Harris would say with one specific expression of this, and because of that, I'm going to declare the entire process as being obsolete and or immoral, dangerous to our future. Now, Thomas Quinn, with 13 subscribers, this, this is what's lovely about having this channel, is that there are wonderful and dear people out there that spot things and send them to me. And about 2,000 views really gave a lovely, now he's an unbeliever, so he's not a Christian, but he really gave a lovely analysis of the events. And I thought he was dead on. And I think he, he calls both Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris on things. But I think he just is exactly right about Sam Harris in this. And I think this is why Sam Harris is declining and Jordan Peterson is rising. Now, maybe Sam Harris will join him. I don't know. But I think this is why... In the big fight, Jordan Peterson's stock continues to ascend, and I think Jordan Peterson is pulling people away from Sam Harris. And I think that's going to continue because I think Jordan Peterson has the better argument. Now, I want to talk about Sam Harris on traditional religion because Sam Harris is just plain wrong. When Sam Harris says, well, everybody believes God is da 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 Well, yes and no, Sam. If you're living in 20th century and 21st century English-speaking world and you're looking specifically at Christians of a certain background, of a certain milieu, yes, they all believe what you say they believe. But that's just one layer of their belief. That, in fact, is for many of them just their conscious belief. And it is not true, number one, of the majority of what natural religious belief and expression is, not only in the 21st century or the 20th century or the 19th century, but going all the way back to the beginning of recorded civilization. Because Peterson is right and you are wrong. But what Peterson is doing is he is holding up a little statue and saying, see, because you can't see his axioms in the statue. What you can, if you look at enough of the pattern, if you read enough of the mythology, if you actually study the history of religion a little bit, you don't even have to study it much. Peterson isn't that much of an expert in all of this. He's read enough to know enough to say, this is what I see happening, okay? These axioms are being expressed below the surface. Now, remember, he's a pragmatist. Remember his definition of belief. 
belief, what we truly believe, now we are alienated from our beliefs to a degree, we don't see them, they're not transparent to us, but what we act out what we truly believe. And if we read religious texts, and we have look at how religious people act, and I would argue if we look at how normal people that say whether or not they're an atheist today, now again, now somebody in the Sam Harris type is probably not going to be like Verizon Lisa standing outside of the cell phone saying, the universe is saying, buy a cell phone. They're going to say, that's woo-woo. No universe talking to me. I am feeling the desire to buy a cell phone and I am going to buy it. Well, then you got problems with your own determinism and your own expression of free will. Maybe they'll say, from the Big Bang henceforth, the universe has ordained that I will walk into this Verizon cell phone store and buy a cell phone. What, am I not getting paid by Verizon for this? Where Verizon, where, hey, I'm even wearing a red shirt. Look at Bucko. Come on, Verizon, send in a little cash. <laughs> From the Big Bang onward, you were destined to walk into that Verizon cell phone. You were destined to feel it. You were, now here's what, in a sense... You might say Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein are saying, from the Big Bang onward, if you're a materialist, maybe Brett Weinstein, not Jordan Peterson, the universe gave you the experience of imagining the universe is talking to you and also saying, Lisa, you look good today. It's all packed into the Big Bang, right? Boom. Give me one miracle and I'll explain the rest. That's, in a sense, their position. It's a hard position to hold. Even Calvinists aren't this deterministic, at least not most of us. And I'm thinking about some videos about Calvinism and determinism because I know a lot of you have asked for them. I actually wrote a long video this morning that this one preempted when I started listening to some of this stuff. But it, it very much is it, it very much is is along the same lines. So Traditional religion, read the Bible. God is that which causes everything. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, you find it again and again. Jonathan and his armor, armor bearer. Let's go fight these uncircumcised Philistines. Who knows? God may deliver them into our hands. Because no one can stop this God from saving. You find these phrases again and again and again and again and again in the Bible. Whenever something happens, well, this is what Jesus is debating when a tower falls on some people. Um, or the man born blind, who sinned, him or his parents. It's simply assumed broadly, not just within Judaism or Christianity, but the paganisms of the ancient world. Not all the philosophies, okay? But it's the majority religion simply assumes that God is the source of all these things and he can be negotiated with with all of that. The, these axioms that Peterson are, is articulating, most of them are true broadly of what I'd call common religion or natural religion. They are all over the place in the ancient world. You will find them in Christianity. You will find them in, in Hinduism. You will find them in Buddhism. Certain aspects of it, and we're going to talk about that, because Harris says, no, Hinduism has different stories. Yeah, but when you go and you see the temples and you see the idols and you see the sacrifices, and when you watch them feeding the rats, and when you when you watch them getting nervous about someone getting sick in their family and having to do prayers, this is all common religion. This is all over the place. This is these are the assumptions that have been built into us from the ground up. Now maybe Sam Harris is saying we should evolve past all this. Good luck. It's going to be a hard climb. And this is probably part of the reason that atheists, when they get old and their body starts breaking down and maybe they're starting to lose reason, they start getting religious again. This is deeply built into us from the ground up. And again, this is not different from what John Calvin said in terms of the census divinitatis. We are, or Augustine said, we are built for him. All of the hookups match. Now again, those from the bottom who are skeptical about the top will say, yeah, they all look to match because they're grown up from the bottom. I understand that's your argument. But this is not this argument is not in contradiction with the history of Christianity or the history of Protestantism, at least. I'm not going to speak for all Protestants. I'm not even going to speak for all Calvinism. 
just the Dutch Calvinism that I inherited in its particular brand in the Christian Reformed Church. If something happened, God did it. Sort of. And it's that sort of, that, that space in there that becomes the space in which so much religious conversation happens. This nuance of the space in which religious discussions thrive. Is there a dualism? Is there good, is it good versus evil? Peterson said that a lot. Is there determinism? Does God, does God cause evil? So, you know, all this Calvinist debate about God's will and our will and agency and all of that, and C.S. Lewis gets into that. Do human actions and character matter? This is traditional religion, and it is not simply that which is now. It goes all the way back. Jordan Peterson is not changing the definition of God. There's a book by Charles Colson. Oh, what is it named? I just read it a few, I just read it last year or a couple of years ago. Uh, if you remember in the comment section, put it in there, Charles Colson's book. Charles Colson grew up as I think an Episcopal, never paid much attention to it. Simultaneously, while he's Nixon's hatchet man and all this bad stuff happened, he starts converting to evangelicalism and he starts having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And this, for Charles Colson, is a conversion experience. And Charles Colson's parents can't figure out what's happening to him because, well, you've always been a Christian. And Charles Colson, no, now I'm alive. Now I'm an evangelical. Now I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I talk to Jesus and I see him answer me in the situations of my life. Look at T.M. Lerman. I forget the name of her book. She's an anthropologist that did some time in a vineyard church. This talking back and forth to God. This is what drives Sam Harris crazy. This is having a personal relationship with Jesus. This is this is American evangelicalism, okay? And Sam Harris is saying, ah, it's not that kind of God, okay? But all the rest upon which this evangelicalism is based on, Evangelicalism does not deny the rest. It is the platform upon which evangelicals have their relationship. All of that is common all across human history. With all the varieties of religions and religious stories, this transactional nature of our relationship with God, it might not be a personal relationship with God, it might look like a relationship with natural law. It might look like laws of physics. It might look like all of that. But Peterson is right here. He's just right. And you see it all over the place. Look at trial by fire, water, and animal. Read the book of Daniel. The book starts with a trial by food, and Daniel thrives, and so the king puts everyone else on Daniel's diet. There's the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you learned any of these stories in, in Sunday school, if you ever went to Sunday school. There's Daniel in the lion's den. These are all trials. Well, what's a trial? Well, you throw someone into the lion's den, and if they're a sinner, they get eaten. That tells you how many sinners there are. If they're a righteous man, the lions won't touch them. Okay, what does that mean? God speaks through action. The the sky, there's an eclipse, and everyone says the gods are 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 displeased with us. Look at a a tweet that Jonathan Haidt just posted recently about finding that the conquistadors who described the incredible scale of human sacrifice that they found in Meso in, in the Aztec world. People disbelieved it. Ah, those, those, those evil conquistadors, they were exaggerating. Well, archaeology says, nope, they weren't exaggerating. Why were the Aztecs enslaving and killing all these people to keep the gods at bay? This is universal. And, and these axioms are right there. And so Peterson is saying, this isn't an accident. This isn't one story going astray. This is built into us from the ground up. And, okay, cue Brett Harris and his assassin robots. Brett. Weinstein and his assassin robots. This is our programming. This is how we are. Now, Sam and Brett, in a sense, say, well, we need to transcend this. Okay, 
But at some point, you're going to have to answer the question, well, where are you getting your new morality? Well, from reason. I've got my doubts. I think you're standing on the platform of everything else, and I think Peterson is right by looking at this imagined clean room when water freezes morality that you have and saying, yep, there, this is God free. Uh, I don't buy it. It's not God free. It looks too much like everyone else's. It looks like you're all sharing this huge platform and you have this tiny little hut on top of a very big mountain and you're saying, nope, no God here. And just say, look down about 3.5 million years. It's all God all the way down. It's just how we're built. That's what Peterson and Weinstein are saying. Well, trial is, ubiquit is as ubiquitous as sacrifice, and they are deeply connected. Look at casting lots and divination and astrology. God speaks in outcomes. Common religion is human beings trying to engineer outcomes. Now, Sam Harris would say, well, it's an obsolete technology. Fair enough. But technology is religion's secular child. It is. Why does alchemy figure in? And when Jordan, when Jordan Peterson first started talking about alchemy, I thought, why is he talking about alchemy? And the more I thought about it, the more I looked into it, I thought, oh, it makes perfect sense. Why did, why was Newton both this incredible genius that gave us Newtonian com, um, mechanics that moved us forward so far towards, towards science and technology and also deeply interested in alchemy? That well, makes perfect sense. It, it makes perfect sense. Now, here's the thing. Alchemy gets removed from the story because we say it's unimportant. Oh, well, now who's rejiggering history? And who's, who's the winner now who is retelling history in a skewed way? So don't ask any questions about alchemy. Why were they looking at alchemy? Oh, that's just some silly thing they did on the side. No, it's part of the story that put this together. You are not going to get rid of religion like this. Your little hut on the mountain saying, no religion here, and not buying it. Oh, but it's different from the East. And when I heard that, I thought, I can't believe you said that. Have you paid any attention to spirituality in the West for the last hundred years? Look up the Law of Attraction the power of the teachings of Abraham. What? Well, you know, what's the law of attraction? Well, I'll show you a little video of it. It'll explain how the law of attraction works. This is from the East. Or look at the secret. This is from the East. Christians have been complaining about this stuff. Evangelicals have been complaining about this stuff for a long time because you know what? It sells. How do we know it sells? Well, just watch people do it. So, so what is the law of attraction? Well, here we are. This is going to really send your woo meter off. Everything we as human beings have created on this planet was essentially first created in our minds. All that you see, which is human work on this planet, first found expression in the mind, then it got manifested in the outside world. So one thing we need to understand is, the wonderful things that we have done on this planet and the horrible things that we have done on this planet, both have come from the human mind. So if we are concerned as to what we create in this world, it's extremely important that first of all, we learn to create the right things in our mind. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to sit through this. Law of attraction. Well, what is the law of attraction? Well, first you manifest it in your mind and then it comes to you in your life. This is, this is religion. This is, there are deep ties to Hindu aspects of Hinduism, aspects of Buddhism. This is, this stuff sells like mad and it's total woo woo. I get that. And so, you know, when they're, when you're, when you're putting on your deep boots, I'm, I'm right there with Sam Harris and I was saying, I, I ain't buying any of this. And Jordan Peterson isn't either. 
Christians have been doing some of the same things, you know? Your best life now. Now you just have Christian ways to get this. And again, in this video I wrote this morning, which I haven't, which I haven't put together yet, I'll see if I do it. You know, I'll run through some of the history of, of gods and then of polytheism and then henotheism and then monotheism. And then what I think we're really just turning back into is once again back to polytheism. But we say, no, I'm rational. Well, again, watch Jonathan Haidt's The Rationalist Delusion in Moral Psychology. And what Jonathan, one of the things Jonathan Haidt does is shows that, you know, whether you're Christian or other, you're, you're, we're, we're not so rational. And he has these little test stories. Is it moral to have sex with your sibling if there's zero chance of pregnancy? Okay, answer that. Is that moral? Why or why not? Jonathan Haidt does these experiments, and so he, he brings people in a room and says, you know, is that moral? And people are like, well, well, they're not going to get pregnant. There's no chance of pregnancy. Well, I just don't think it's right. Well, why not? I don't know. Oh, so you have a moral layer in you that is pre-rational, that you haven't discerned, and that things just pop up sometimes and you say, that's right, that's wrong. It just feels that way to me. Well, what is that? Well, it's what Jordan Peterson's talking about. Or, is it moral to have sex with the poultry you purchased at the store? He has this crazy story about someone going to the store and buying, you know, a chicken and a cellophane moral pa package to take home and have sex with. Okay, that's just shot of the night story. Very imaginative story. Probably not a story I would have ever thought of. Uh, maybe he at, maybe he was a clinical psychologist for a while and heard a story. As a pastor, you hear some stories that you would never have thought of. Okay, here's the question. Say, well, I don't know that that's morally wrong. Well, let me ask you this. If you came home from school one day and saw dad going at it with what was going to be your dinner and said, oh, hi, son, how was the day? Excuse me while I finish up here. Do you think there'd be a moral issue involved? Or, if you're a father came home and found your son doing it to a chicken, oh, hi, Dad, I've got the chicken and the turkey and we're all lined up, care to join me? How would you feel about that? Do you think that would be moral? Or would you say, no, that's sick? And, Paul Vanderclay, you're a sick man for thinking up a story like that. Well, there you go. I'm a Calvinist. I'm a sick man by creed. Would you agree to lick a cockroach if a scientist told you it had been sanitized? No. <laughs> but you kiss your dog, you kiss your cat, you even kiss your kid. A sanitized cockroach is probably less dangerous than your dog, your cat, or your kid. Ever have your dog lick you on your lips? Yep, I know it happens. It's like, that's disgusting. Now let's add some axioms to Peterson's, because I think Peterson is right, and he got cut off, and you can go like this all day long. God is that which holds everyone accountable for this unpunished secular frame. I think we deeply believe that and long for it. And, you know, I'll have, I'll have very unchurched people walk through my door, talk to me in the sanctuary, drop an F-bomb, say the S-word, and then say, oh, sorry, Pastor. What's that about? Well, they believe stuff. They believe stuff about God and moral judgment. It's built into them. I find that deeply secular people will long to have their enemies burn in hell. And they will use the hell word even if they don't believe it. Well, I think Adolf Hitler is in hell. Well, do you believe in hell? No. And so what that usually revolves around is hell is only a, is a hell is a place where genocidal dictators and people I don't like go. All right. Fair enough. Point for Sam Harris. But the whole structure of that is there. And Peterson I think is dead on right and really nails him. God is that which brings joy and fulfillment to everyone oppressed in the secular frame. Now, if you think about these things, and you think about human life, how many people have been the victims of injustice? Well, all of us, one kind or another. How many people have been 
the victims of cruel injustice and nobody knows and nobody tells. How many people have had their little lives snuffed out and nobody gave them a funeral? Well, we know the Nazi atrocities, we know the gulags, we know Mao. There is no God that saw any of that. There's no one that cares. These people are all gone. Now you may take a moment and say, oh, I'm having a moral feeling and that that feeling is somehow balancing the scales of history. I don't think your feeling cares. I don't think your feeling balances anything. In fact, Jordan Peterson, if you read, I think it's chapter 3 and 12 rules, does a really credible job of saying, yeah, to what degree... To what degree are you just fooling yourself by having this feeling and you're having this feeling in order to feel like a moral person and to validate yourself? The, 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 the millions who were killed by Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, Paul Pot, Idi Amin, Papa Doc, Baby Doc, Trujillo, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, um, Somoza in Nicaragua, and those are just ones in the 20th century. Just go throughout human history. It's just about everybody. Most of the world was crushed and lived lives like this. And you say, well, a lot of people say, well, see, that's an argument for there isn't any God. All right, I can understand why you make that point. Here's my point. You have no God? They all got away with it. I think deep inside of us, we imagine... There's a God who will judge. We sure hope there's a God who will judge. And I think it's even that axiom that sets up the that sets up the problem of evil as a troubler of Christianity. That assumption that there must be a God who saw and sees all that suffering and will somehow have some way to right the scale. Well, Hindus, they have different stories. Well, what do they have? Karma. What's karma about? Well, it's all going to get righted in history. Isn't that what karma is about? You reincarnate, you recycle, and now you're going to pay for it. Or my name is Earl. Remember that story that was on a few years ago? You know, it's in my name is Earl. It's within the secular frame. So it all has to happen in this lifetime. Do good things, good things happen. Do bad things, bad things happen. This is built into us. You're not going to get rid of it. God is that which addresses every injustice in the secular frame. And this is where we begin to get into trouble because, okay, within the secular frame, if Donald Trump is running roughshod over the justice of pick his favorite victims or flip it and have Barack Obama running roughshod, I don't care. Well, when does justice need to come? When do we want it? Now. What does that mean? Someone's got to die. I was having a conversation about Lord's Supper and fencing the table and all of all of that kind of theological stuff yesterday. And, and so you've got churches that want to say, well, anyone should be able to come and have the Lord's Supper. And then I ask you, would you serve Donald Trump? Would the Episcopalians church serve Donald Trump? Donald Trump was baptized, I think, at Marble Collegiate, an RCA church in New York City. I have a certain amount, I have a certain understanding of what Marble Collegiate RCA believes now. I dare bet if Donald Trump went forward for communion, they wouldn't serve him. Why? This stuff matters to us. And if there's no afterlife for judgment, it's got to come now. Well, okay. Let's say you caught Hitler. What could you do to Hitler that would possibly account for what he did to the world? Put him in prison? Is that good enough? Yeah, he's an older man. What, 20 years in prison? Until he dies? Free meals? Free health care? Hardly seems right. Maybe you want to torture him. Well, how's that going to go? How much torture could that... I don't know how old Hitler was when World War II ended. Um, how much torture could that dude endure? Could he... Could he endure enough torture to account for all of the instances of torture that he was responsible for? How much torture was he responsible for? What kind of information and math would you need to have in order to do that? 
Almost everybody wants to believe in a God of justice because God alone can adequately judge because God alone has all the information, is capable of complete objectivity, is able to apply a perfect remedy. Let's assume Hitler got caught and was brought to the Nuremberg trials. Would you in those trials bring the families of victims and have them be judges? No. They can be witnesses, but they can't be the judge. Our ideas about justice today are that, well, let's say, if you're going on, if you're going to be on a jury and the, the trial is over a DUI, someone got caught driving drunk, what will both of the lawyers ask you? Have you ever been convicted of a DUI? Have you had a family member convicted of a DUI? Why? Because you want the jury to be impartial because that's, we don't want personal bias involved because that's justice. Well, who could actually hold Hitler accountable? Well, who could say exactly how much suffering was Hitler accountable for throughout history? It's like, yeah, but boy, you know, what about the people that formed Hitler? What about his parents? What about his friends? What about the situation of his ideas? When you begin to get into influence, you begin to see that there are millions of things going out, and no human being in any way could possibly begin to account for any of it. Then you say, well, there must be a God that would know all, would be both a God of justice, but also have the capacity, while being a God of justice, would be angry at injustice to also be able to judge fairly. Because any God that would be less capable of that would be less of a God and wouldn't be a God at all. This is what our hearts long for. This is what I think is built into us that we assume is there. But he's also the God of relationship. A God that which fulfills, now this God tends to be a little newer than the old God, I think. But not so much, because mystics go back a long ways. A God that is that which fulfills every dream and hope for intimacy, because he can know you like nothing else could. He can evaluate you fairly like no one else ever could. He sees you masturbate, Sam. He knows. He really does. Can love you perfectly, because everyone else is working from their need and desire to use you, can never be separated from you by an intervening power because there is no power greater than him. You know, in other words, if you start doing this, you begin to realize, if you don't have a God like this, you really have to invent one. Because, and, and, every, and every time you work on the definition, he gets better and better and better and better. He's the God of perfect justice. And he's the God of perfect relationships. And he's the God of, you know, you just have perfection and perfection and perfection. Now, you can see this and say, well, that's a really good argument that, that we made God. Okay, Jordan Peterson, he's working from below. He's not disagreeing with that. He's just saying, I'm leaving the top agnostic, okay? I'm going to leave that agnostic. But from below, there's real reasons why we would construct such a being in our imagination, and such a being would be enormously useful for a society to function properly. I've been preaching through the Old Testament, and I'm in Second Kings right now, and last week the sermon, I think, really flopped. You know, my rough draft, my mental, my Jordan Peterson fed mental millions, com minions completely pulled it apart while I was doing the rough draft, and then I didn't have a lot of week to pull it together, and I was, it was still too... It wasn't ready for Sunday morning, but Sunday morning comes, so you go up with the sermon you have, and, and I'm hoping I pulled it out right there at the Lord's Supper, but who knows? Sermons don't always go well, trust me. But here's the thing. You had the temple of the Lord, and you have the temple of Baal. You have these two gods. Well, you might say, well, there's... Go back, um, you know, you can find Yahweh in, in, other, in other of the surrounding tribes. Did the Hebrews just appropriate him? And, you know, we can have that whole conversation. But you have the temple of the Lord and the temple of Baal. The difference in their religion will play out in the lives of the people. If, if Baal is basically a transactional god that says, you can have sex with a chicken, 
you can you can pretty much do anything with anyone. Just bring me the offerings. Then that god is kind of like a mob boss. And a lot of the gods of the ancient world were kind of like mob bosses. Then you've got the Lord. And and the Lord, I see my right and left, I'm dyslectic. I can never know which hand to raise. Then the Lord says, I desire obedience more than sacrifice. Well, what does that mean? And Ezekiel says, if there's corruption in the temple, there'll be bigger corruption in the streets. What's true of the temple gets expressed in people's lives. If you don't have purity in the church, you've got no hope in the streets. That's why the Roman Catholic or the um, pedophile priest scandal was so devastating for Catholics. Because, and this is why pastors are under such such pressures to be moral fakes because we're sinners too but nobody likes a sinful pastor well we do and we don't it gets really complicated fast i'm not going to go there but this is how this works and this is how it works for all of us and and these things are even at play in the moments we are criticizing what's going on so you might say, okay, dreamer, Paul Vanderclay, just because you can conceive of such a being doesn't mean it exists. True. But, as I just said, that which is at the center gets played out in the periphery. What are the multi-generational implications for coming to the conclusion that such a God does not exist? We don't know. See, again, if you go back to Peterson's first axiom and first first parenthetical remark and you read those peterson is dead on right that even though we're leaving we're living just kind of me and my little life we are deeply tied to each other generationally well, where have i read that before it's in the bible we're deeply tied to each other generationally as i mentioned in a previous video the actions of my great-great-grandfather, where somehow he fell out of favor with his Jewish synagogue and his Jewish family, and he took his family, and he moved to America, and he got in with all the Dutch Calvinists, and on and on and on. And wherever his Jewish ancestors before left whatever other place where it was bad for Jews, and then went to, you know, Friesland in the Netherlands, where... They were trying to, you know, carve out a life. And the decisions made by my great-grandfather and my grandfather and my great-great-grandfather and my father have all come down into me. And that's just four generations. We go way, 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 way back. And, and all of this stuff is tied together. None of it's lost. And this, again, is why, well, who could judge me? Well, you'd have to go all the way back and judge my great-grandfather with me. Well, that doesn't seem fair. That kind of stuff is all happens all the time in religion. It gets, these are the conversations. These are the nuances. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I will hold, um, I will not hold guiltless the second and third generation. But then in Ezekiel 18, we're talking about it again. It's, that's into this, this video that I wrote this morning that I'm, that I'm not doing right now because I felt like doing this one instead. This stuff is built into us. The multi-generational implications for coming to the conclusion that such a God does not exist, we don't know. What does it mean if Joseph Stalin got away with it? What is he an example of to us? That if we, that if we kill enough enemies, that if we're brutal enough, that if we keep the world scared enough, the world can be our oyster? Because... Joseph Stalin, well, I don't know, he was raised in the church, wasn't he? Did he believe he had to face a god? Even if you read Plato's Republic, very early chapters, even the Greeks, one of the one of the one of the old men there is, why are people just? Because they're afraid of God at judgment or the gods. Egyptian Book of the Dead. This stuff is common. Same with the Hindus, same with the Buddhists. Now, again, that there's lots of, the religions are very, 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 very complicated. And there's lots of competing and cross, 
cross-pressured stories involved. But this layer that I'm talking about, pretty much universal. Well, here's a question. Let's bring it into the real world. How to deal with dictators? You had Idi Amin and Baby Doc. They went into exile. I look at the North Korea situation. I ask the question, how much money would it take to bribe Kim Jong-un to go into exile and let Korea unify? Idi Amin got bribed into exile. Baby Doc got bribed into exile. It would certainly cost less money than a war, except maybe not as good for the economy. Well, maybe he retires to L.A. Maybe the U.S. basically signs a you pass the Congress passes legislation that that Kim Jong Un will not be tried for the crimes against the people of North Korea. What if we let him have billions and be the kind of playboy he wants to be? Maybe he can go up to movie stars and grab them where he wants and sleep with porn stars and and have hookers and you know let him let him have his best life now and we'll 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 not have a war in the Korean peninsula and you know the two Koreas can get together and would that be good would kim jong un get away with it would that be right think about the question these questions are inescapable we bump into them all the time Rationally, it seems like paying him off and letting him to go into cushy exile might be a good idea. What about morality? Well, maybe you can do it if you believe, yeah, we'll, we'll give you some money and we'll, you let, we'll let you live the next 40, 50 years hooping it up. But someday, buddy, you're going to have to answer for everything that you've done. People like to believe that of others. We don't like to believe that of ourselves. So the religious instincts, they're surely problematic. <laughs> I, as a pastor, know this as well as anyone. The Hebrew prophets knew this. In fact, the Bible is not a list of rules. It's a long conversation about all these kinds of things. Just read the Bible. It's all over the place. We have every reason to believe they have been essential, they have been essential for humanity surviving a very brutal history. I think Jordan Peterson and, and Brett Weinstein are exactly right on this. Religion has been essential for us getting through. Is it enormously problematic? Yes. The Aztec religion both helped them cope with death and caused death. Well, can we pick between religions? We should. Are we going to say all religions are the same? No. How do we evaluate between religions? Well, now it's getting harder. Now we're seeing why it's talk, 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 and all this talk is better than killing, which is often what happens between religions. Because remember, probably every war is a story conflict, this, and we are the hosts. Can we be sure, can we be so sure we'll no longer need them, or that, or what will become without them? Well, Peter Hitchin, Christopher Hitchin's brother, wrote a book, The Rage Against God. That's his assertion of what happens when you give up God in your story verse. He points to the Soviet Union. He was a journalist. He lived there. He watched it. He was, he was close to it. This is his account of it. The, the little thing says how atheism led me to faith. He was raised in the church, rejected the church. His brother Christopher became one of the four horsemen. Peter went the other way and became a Christian. Can you fool yourself? Can regular people like Verizon and Lisa really live as if? Well, Lisa is living that way. By the phone, Lisa, and you look good today. Well, there you go. Um, one of the things that has been stalking my mental mil minions is, here's the question. Can you, you can listen to Jordan Peterson and say, ah, I really see his point. I, th I think religion is essential. I think we need it. And, you know, I hear when I listen to Dennis Prager, some of his videos, I hear him say, yeah, religion is important. I think, yeah, I think religion is important. What does it take, though? Can you live as if? Well, probably more is better than less. But the details matter, as Peterson says again and again. The devil's in the details. What are the details of your religion? What's at the top of your religious hierarchy? You have the Aztecs and their religion. Uh, I don't hear a lot of people advocating that anymore. Why? Well, 
this is the religious conversation. This is why human beings have been talking about religion pretty much nonstop ever since we started to talk. People who believe they are constructed want a constructed environment to help them believe. This, I think, is actually why you go to church, because it's a, it's a Ulysses trial. Ulysses binds himself to the mass, tells his sellers to put wax in their ears so they can't hear the sirens, but he wants to see if he can resist the sirens. But you know what? He's not going to put the boat in jeopardy, so he says, don't listen to anything I say. Bind me to the mast. I want to see if I'm too strong for the sirens. Nope, the sirens would win. That's us. So, if you realize that you are weak, well, what do you say? Well, I need help. Well, if you're an alcoholic and you need help, what do you find? You find a 12-step group. If you're a mess and you need help, and your mess is global in your life, where do you go? You start looking for a God. Well, what kind of God do you want to look for? Well, you want to look for a God who is incorruptible. You want to look for a God who is completely just. You want to look for a God who knows everything is completely just. And here's the Christian edition, is your father. Now, when you hear Jordan Peterson talking about conceptualizing God as a father, well, there is one of the additions that Jesus makes to Judaism. You can find it implicit in some places in the Old Testament. For example, in, in Hosea 11, where it talks about Israel as a son. But Jesus comes right out of the gate and says, Abba, Father, Abba, which is Father in, in Aramaic, and says, God is our Father. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's my day job. This is what that means. So that's the video. So, yep, the Peterson, Sam Harris, bootleg audio recordings are out. We're all waiting on the good video recordings because they're a little muddled, but you can kind of make them and I'm not going to put the I'm not going to put the links in there. I it's a gray area. But just about everything I've said here could be constructed from, except for the quotes, of course, could be constructed from what they've been talking about before. There's no surprises here. The question you have to decide is, well, who's right? And you get to choose. Your mental million, minions are, are in there working on it, chattering away, trying to decide for themselves, and at some point they'll inform your conscious self, and then the rider on your elephant will start making excuses for why you're you're changing friends, but this is the arguments. Hope it's helpful. Leave a comment. All the other YouTubers say to subscribe, so maybe I should say that too, because I've just been following the herd. So subscribe.